Jillian has not only uh, triumphed over obesity, she shed over 200 pounds, but she's also conquered a myriad of health challenges, including uh, depression, anxiety, hypertension, diabetes, endometriosis, arrhythmia, fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, and IBS. But <laughs> her story doesn't stop there. Jillian, she was so resilient that she she overcame alcohol and food addiction and she transformed her life in ways that are going to leave you and left me in sheer amazement so green warriors you just prepare to be inspired because jillian is going to share that transformation and we're going to learn a lot of her lessons and valuable lessons that she, that she learned along the way right jillian I hope so. Yeah. I'm excited to share. It's nerve wracking and uncomfortable, but I think it's necessary. <laughs> yes. And I, I really do appreciate that you were willing to do this because first of all, you haven't been on anyone's show. So that, that in itself, even if you were just talking about, you know, what you did today, that would be kind of, you know, a little bit nerve wracking, but you're willing to open up to us. And there's just, to me, there's so many people that, that are going through a lot of different conditions now. I don't know that that there are many people that may be watching that may have gone through all, everything that you have because there's so many conditions that you had to experience. And there, to me, that I encounter people that use their conditions as an excuse to not make a change because they're in too much pain, mm -hmm. they're too tired, they, they don't have the, what they call willpower, or, you know, and all these things, but, but to have so many conditions at once and still be able to do what you did, which we're gonna talk about, that is just got to be motivating and inspiring for people that are watching now. So I'm really, really happy that you, you're willing to do this. And it's not easy to talk about some of the things that, that we're going to talk about today. And, and it's not easy just to come on the show and, and tell, tell people, but they need to know. And I'm hoping that they'll all be inspired and maybe they know people that have been touched by some of the things that you've experienced and maybe they'll help them sh by sharing this to see if they can help themselves. So we're going to start off uh, by, by, of course, if, if you're new to this channel, I talk about adopting a whole food plant-based lifestyle. So we're going to be discussing that because that is what uh, Julian ultimately did in order to get her to overcome these problems that she was having and food addictions and all kinds of things. So that's what we're gonna be talking about. So I think we'll just start off with our true or false game. It's time for True or False on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below, and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, so the first one is true or false. It is impossible to overeat healthy whole plant foods. Okay, Green Warriors, type in what you think the answer is. Dylan, tell us about that. That is false. <laughs> and uh, let me know when you're ready if you want me to expound on that. Yeah, please do, because nobody's getting graded on this, so we don't care what they type in, because we'll just hear what you have to say about it. I guess it could be true and false or true or false. Uh, but for me, <laughs> that question is false. Uh, because... I, so the food addiction thing, part of the food addiction thing for me was definitely binge eating. And I found myself overeating, if we're going to go ahead and define it, it's eating uh, well past satiety. Well past, I mean, to the point that you are uncomfortable and in pain and totally regret what you just did. And I definitely, so for a long time, uh, going on a whole plant food diet, I really didn't have those kinds of issues. 
but uh, there came times where I did, where something maybe emotionally upsetting happened and I would find myself binging and it was usually on. So, you know, there's the eating to the left of the red line. Well, I would stay within that red line eating uh, low calorie dense foods, but the higher ones like potatoes and beans. And I just like, you know, get to the point where I just wanted that high caloric rush. Dr. Furman was, I got to speak to him at the conference and he was really great at explaining things like um, that high caloric rush. So there's not just being addicted to foods like processed foods, but there's also being addicted to that rush of high calories that you get when you binge, like when you shove in a whole bunch of even healthy plant foods when you throw them in. And so at the beginning, you know, so many people just are able to, oh, you get to eat whatever you want and all that. And I'm sure they do because for them, this is not a problem. So I'm sure they get to eat all that they want. But yeah, I kind of, there's been several times with plant foods that I took it to extremes. Yeah. Now, when we talked about the red line, not everybody is familiar. And there is something called a calorie density chart. And it talks about how there are certain foods that are whole food plant based that as long as you eat those and don't eat the things that are have high calories, for example, nuts and seeds, that is whole food and plant based, but it is high calorie calorically dense. And as long as you don't eat the foods that have those high calories, of course, animal products are very calorie dense. So as long as you do that, then you should be fine and you should achieve weight loss and health and, and all that. But, and, and I even adopted, when, we, when I adopted this lifestyle with my family, we, we were of the same mindset. Well, we could just eat as much as we want. This is great. But it's, it's not. You're right. And there is, there is a point where you can, even eating these healthy foods, you can overdo it. It seems like there must be some kind of a primitive thing in our brain saying it's good to stock up yeah. on as much food as you can so that you don't starve later when the winter comes and there's no food. <laughs> yeah, and Doctors Goldhammer and Lyle, they kind of they really touch on that in the pleasure trap, like where it's instinctive to us to look for the most high calorie dense foods, but unfortunately there's a bunch of unnaturally high calorie foods, but, um, yeah, so I said potatoes and beans, but I forgot. So I left out nuts, <laughs> nuts are like cashews and, uh, cashew, oh, cashews. Um, I can definitely get one of those big bags and finish it and finish it pretty fast. So I have to be careful with nuts, uh, you know, having them in the house. Yes, exactly. They can be. And when I first had adopted the lifestyle and I was and and I think this, but well, this probably most likely happened to you. But I even had uh, cravings and feeling of uncomfortable that I, I I needed something, and I wasn't having my fix of the things that I normally did. And I did have walnuts and raisins in the house because I was using them with vinegar to make different kinds of dressings. And every once in a while, I would go in and grab you know, some of the walnuts and some of the raisins just to get me through my my withdrawal, which is what you go through, you know, when you adopt this lifestyle. And so it did did slow down my results, but after a while I, you know, when I wasn't having as much withdrawal, then I could come off of it. But it's something that uh it affects I, I feel like that there are people that are different uh areas of that maybe that there's a spectrum oh yeah that there's this bell curve in the middle but on one side are people that eh you put it in front of me eh i can do with it do with that i don't really care you know <laughs> if i only have it i can have it once a year and then i'm good and i could come back and wait a whole nother year and have it and then there's most of the population where, you know, we really want to eat this stuff. But then there's the people on the other side of that uh, bell curve where, wow, even just thinking about it would would send them into a frenzy. So, yeah, yeah, it's and, and, and if you're not in that part where of, of the not as many people get that way, then it's maybe hard for you to understand it. Or maybe you are that way and you didn't realize that, yeah, there are other people that are that way too. 
yeah, at the conference, I actually um, connected with a couple and the the wife, no clue what we were talking about, but the husband and I, we would sit there and talk about the difficulty of um, like the ruminating thoughts about food and just like certain things that gets in your head and it is not going away until you have it. And it's very uncomfortable when you are thinking of something and you don't let yourself indulge and managing that and working through it. And, uh, but it's been it, every, since starting to study uh, the whole plant food way, um, there's just so many avenues that get so interesting. So like, like leaky gut and neuroplasticity and habit and so uh, neuro adaptation. So for, I am so thankful that I had, um, you know, there's the community of doctors that we all love, like uh, Clapper and McDougal and Joel Furman and they really talk about this. And I'm glad somebody told me beforehand that because I would have thought that in times past before knowing anything, I would have thought this is just my life. I'm going to be miserable. I'm never going to be happy if I have to eat healthy. But the fact that that changes and that once you eliminate foods, the those connections will be gone and you'll form new ones that actually help you to desire whole plant foods. So I'm glad somebody told me that because it, it really it make it helps you. You just got to hold on. You just got to hold on. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I think that especially for people that have made many attempts with different diet plans and, 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 and then have failed and have felt, Oh, there's something wrong with me. Look at all the people mm -hmm. on the, on the commercial and look at how their before and after pictures are. And there must be something wrong with me because I, I just can't do that. And there's, and I don't think that it's a weakness in the person, right? I don't. I don't think so. I think it's more of, of uh, as we talked about the spectrum that some people have more of that yeah. drive. But I also think that it's just a primitive drive that we all have it want to want sometimes stronger than others. Yeah. Well, so who was it? Um... Maybe it was Dr. McDougall or Dr. Lyle was talking about actually those that. Uh, can seek out and eat a lot and store fat. They're actually the ones that would survive. <laughs> so I was like, yes, I've got. And that's us. That's everybody. <laughs> that's everybody that's watching. Everybody that's living right now. Right. Yeah. We are the descendants of the people who were really good at at storing fat and surviving. Yeah. Right. And so that's a good thing, but um, it means that we're going to have to manage uh, our way through this unnatural environment, um, which can be pretty tricky. Because one of the things that we started to talk about before we got started was, um, so, you know, as far as dates and stuff, I, I know my exact date for serious changes because it was Mother's Day of 2020, right as the, right as everything was heating up. So it was on Mother's Day. That was my first day. And basically all I did was um, I had I had just scratched the surface on researching and I just I eliminated animal products and that was it. I was a total vegan junkie. Everything out there on the market, my and I got I got my kids on board with um, no meat and dairy for a little bit. They did for about nine months and then they went back. But um, so we tested we uh, like all of the the supermarket vegan junk stuff we had um in our phones our web browser we had websites to all the fast food places and the vegan options at all the fast food places and the restaurant chains that we frequented so i mean it was just and funny enough um i mean it oh, i experienced health benefits just from ditching animal products that first 10 days now I did eat vegetables, but, it, but I allowed myself to have whatever I wanted vegan junk food and, um, you know, and Oreos are vegan, but, um, uh, I had lost, I think it was about 12 pounds in 10 days and my blood pressure was coming down a little bit, nothing impressive, but it was. And then over some time, glucose was coming down and this was just from animal products. And I had, so I was losing some weight. And I didn't, I, w I wasn't sure what was going to happen because we talked about, um, you know, we wish when we got started that we had journaled so that yes. we could yes. keep those. But I didn't know, honestly, when I was researching different nutritional approaches, vegan was down at the bottom and I, and definite whole plant food was off my radar. That didn't come till uh, a little bit later, but, um, 
I just, I didn't think I was like, whatever, I'll try it. Cause there was enough data and enough testimonies that was convincing enough to try, but, um, yeah, total vegan junkie and, uh, but still had some benefits and then stagnated and then started, you know, doing different things over the years. So the 200 pounds, and I think it was more, cause honestly, I stopped weighing at a certain point. You just do. I think I've heard a lot of people say that they just didn't look at a scale didn't step on a scale. And, um, so, I mean, it, it could have been more, I was pretty, I was pretty big, but, um, it was when really refining in the last year and a half of really getting close to whole, like just really eliminating all processed foods. And it was all whole plant food things that if I am doing any processing, it's at home, but even that was being limited. That's when real, real stuff started to happen. Mm, and then you mentioned that you have a family. So how did that, yeah. how did navigating that happen? So my husband jumped right on board, but so I had already started and I was only, I was just a little bit in maybe like a week or so. And he is definitely a meat guy and he was a hunter. So, and I really wanted to talk to him about the health stuff and I just couldn't, I was like, how am I going to do this? He is, there's no way, there's no way he's going to say I'm not eating meat and dairy. And, um, so I just, you know, I just prayed and I'm like, okay, father, if this is supposed to happen, you talk to him because it's, it's not going to happen with us. Well, he texted me within a couple of days. He, there was something going on with um, our meat and where it was coming from. And I don't know, there was some big story in the news and he texted me, don't buy any beef until I tell you. And so when he texted that, I was, I said, it's on, we're talking about it. And I had him watch in this order, um, game changers, forks over knives and what the health. And he watched, and I was like, please watch these and have an open mind. And he did. And he was like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> Wow. So, that is so helpful. I he's know. way more amazing in the kitchen than I am. So it's, it's been fun because we, he works back East and our home is in the Ozarks. And so he comes, you know, we go kind of back and forth, but so we were apart for all of this, uh, for getting started. So it was neat seeing him do his thing and how he was managing it. And then uh, I was managing my own ways and then we would come together and, you know, it was just, that was really fun. That is so nice. I know a lot of people wish that their husbands would come on board and we do. Did he have any, uh, any results as far as weight loss or any kind of, uh, medical? He did. He had, he had a little bit of weight loss and, but big thing was his blood pressure and he didn't want to, his blood pressure runs pretty high. It just has for a while. And, um, he, it did come down, but he, we, you know, like I said, we were on vegan junk food, so it did come down ditching the animal products and that was impressive. And, but it just kind of stagnated because we, we were still eating, um, processed foods and stuff. And he still, even though he does vegan and he's not a total vegan junkie, he does indulge in that kind of stuff. But just recently we've both, cause I told you I had a food addiction thing, rear its ugly head here recently. So we both have recommitted and getting back on track and just trying to really be strong about it. Wow. That's great. It's great to have the support. And now you said you had children too, right? Yep. They were grown when we got started. Well, my daughter may have been 18, but they were grown and in the house and they, they did the vegan junkie thing with me because yeah. <laughs> why wouldn't you? It's all delicious. Mm. But, um, then after about seven or nine months, I noticed they would talk about, it was just little things that they would say that I'm like, did you have meat on your Taco Bell? And they were like, yeah. And there was never, um, I, I didn't force it. I wasn't wanting right. to be, I mean, they have to, it has to be from them, yeah. but yeah. So slowly it was, they were, um, eating whatever, but they were pretty respectful as far as, um, I'm trying to think if they ever brought meat in the house. I think I'm sure they did, but it just wasn't a big deal. Cause I, after, at some point it was like, I didn't even want meat in the fridge. Cause I had read about chicken, like salmonella. It doesn't, you don't even have to eat it. It can just be in the air and get on yes. stuff. And I just really didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to look at it. And, um, but they were, they were, they were very respectful. They've been very respectful the whole time. Well, that's, that's great. It's great to have either 
they're, at least if they're not on board, at least to be respectful of, of, of what your choices are. And, yeah. and eventually it, it will, I think it'll happen. You just keep being that good example. And so, but there is, you know, I've been putting up kind of your little, little short thing about what you've gone through. So, um, I mean, there, there's just a lot of things that uh, you had to deal with. And so do, would you think that the depression and anxiety was a result of all the things that you had, or was that just something that happened to you all of your life? So I really think, so of course I have some, um, some typical stories of woe from, you know, growing up like most of us do, like a lot of us do. But I honestly think that I, I didn't realize the connection. It was a long time before I realized the connection between processed foods and animal products and our mental health. I really didn't know that 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 came a while. Um, it, it came after the health stuff, like the physical health stuff in my research and um, knowing how the difference I feel. And since I'm sad and frustrated with myself for this recent thing, um, kind of derailing from whole plant foods and eat and indulging in vegan junk food. But I'm also kind of glad for it because I have a, a staunch difference. Everything was so slow before because I gave myself such a slow, I mean, I was just having fun with it. So it was such a slow transition from total vegan junkie to whole plant booty. I mean, it was very incremental. Right. And you were, you, originally you did eat animal products. And then originally I did. Junk. Right. Okay. Yeah. Before, before May 10th, 2020. Yeah. It was, it was, it, yeah, it was meat, yeah, just, dairy, all of it. Mm -hmm. But, um, so feeling the difference of when getting it cleaned and refined and definitely as strict, I do very well with rules. And so when, and I know a lot of people talk about that they don't and it frustrates them and they need to have, to be able to have a lot. I've heard people say this, but I don't relate to that because I, when, when there are rules and I know my boundaries, I do very well. So very, so a, a really simple rule is if it's not a whole plant food, I don't eat it. So it's just really easy to, to stick to that. And I can cook it any way I want, which is how I first got started before a big refinement. Like I can cook it however I want. I can process however I want at home and have whatever I want, how much ever I want. And so I had this really gentle transition into it. So there was, so getting better and feeling well was slow. And so it was kind of hard to remember where you were, how bad you felt before when it's so slow getting better and then introducing some of those foods again, um, you know, vegan junk food. And then just after some time and you just feel so bad and you feel that melancholy come back and the gloominess and anxiety and agit oh, agitation, just like everything agitating me. And, um, and that's the only thing that's changed. You know, I do think though, um, I'm pretty sure I've been in perimenopause for the last year <laughs> that I didn't realize until um, a few months ago. Well, maybe six months ago, I realized what was going on, but, and I'm sure that plays in there too. But um, definitely I feel like listening to other women, I feel like my symptoms are kind of moderate compared <laughs> Because the biggest thing I experience is these unexplained emotional things. But I also, both of my kids also moved out in that period. And though I don't really consider myself a, a depressed empty nester, it was a big change. Like my, you know, they were, they were at home as adults for a long time and we were pals, the three of us hanging out, you know? And so it's a big change when your life is not <laughs> revolving around them anymore. Yeah, that's true. We have, we have another true or false question kind of talking a little bit about uh, food. So Dream Warriors, true or false, food companies hire scientists to create formulas in order to achieve a bliss point. So type in your guess for that, and then we're going to talk about that. Okay, Julie, what do you say? I say true, and if you're ever in doubt, read this book. Yes. This is a good one. It's a, it's very dense, but um, it will make you very it will make you angry enough to not want to be anyone's puppet anymore, and it will make you want to reject that that the fast foods and the processed foods. Oh, another one is um, Joel Furman's fast food genocide. That's a great one. 
Yes, yeah. absolutely. It'll get you fired up. Because, because I, you know, when people think about fast food, right, they think about the, the, the junk food and the chips or whatever it is that, 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 or, or driving through, you know, drive through at a fast food restaurant. But that's not all that he's talking about in his right. book, right? Because, I mean, he, 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 it's, it's just, he it's amazing. It all. Yeah. And that any, any food that goes through your digestive system quickly mm -hmm. is considered a fast food. So, and let have an example, oil, right? Mm -hmm. That's fast food. And he talks about how that that it's imagine if you saw somebody that was in the hospital and they had an IV, an intravenous, and they and you would see it going through the little tube like drop and you would see it just coming out, drop, 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 just little by little, versus if somebody gave somebody an injection. And so that's the difference between eating an olive is like having that IV drip, 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 because it's got the fiber and it's got all the other things in it, versus having oil, it's like having that injection. It just it just shoots through your system fast. So that's yeah. that's what he's talking about with fast food genocide, not just those the takeout. Yeah. Food. Not yeah. just the QSR, not just the quick service restaurants, but yeah, because and then so it's not just the toll it takes on the body, but what it does on dopamine receptors and putting you in a state of um, where you're uh, dopamine insensitive and then you're it just makes it worse and worse to where you're so miserable when you don't get to get those things. And so what does he say? Joel Furman is probably my favorite of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and he says enforced abstinence, abstinence. And in our everything in moderation culture, that's, um, you know, that's a tall order because we're used to, oh, if it's in moderation, it's okay. But no, definitely not for me anyway. And many that I hear from, not for them either. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anne said, I've adopted a plant-based diet and I have not. I'm convinced it's the only way to go for all sorts of reasons, but the anxiety and cravings do me in all the time. Oh, yeah. Trying anti-anxiety medication. Maybe we could um, talk about that because that's something uh, that somebody had a question about, I think. So let me just see if we can, if I can find it for you, because we, well, first of all, I mean, were, were you, because you had the depression and the anxiety, were you on, oh yeah, here it was, my Nova Man said, I battled depression and anxiety. If you were on any medications, were you able to get off of any of them? I was, and I did. So when I was 18, I had my son and Probably there was a lot of postpartum there and I went to see a doctor and I, you know, just the overwhelming, just sad and melancholy and not thriving. And I was worried I had this baby and um, he just, he didn't require talk therapy or anything, which I absolutely loathe. <laughs> so I was happy and he was willing to throw pills at me. So um, I thought, okay, we'll try. And um, so that was just a short stint. And I don't really remember my experience on them at that time because it was so short. Like it had only been a few months, less than a year anyway. But then later, about um, when I was 23, those were the dates I was telling you that I was looking up when I was about 23. Uh, I went and was, I just could not manage. I could not talk myself out of it, out of being so sad. And and anxious and gloomy and agitated. And uh, so I went and talked and again, they didn't, they suggested and encouraged talk therapy or a counselor or something like that, but didn't require it. And I think it was Zoloft that they put me on. And it was just one and I'm thankful now because I don't know how, I don't know because there's some that are really like some of these psychotropic ones. I don't know. I there were there weren't because I hear about people being on multiple of them, and this was a long time ago, so this would have been in 2000. But it was just that one. But it was 10 years, 
And then I wanted off. And so I had, I just wanted to be done with it. I just did. And there wasn't, I was, I think I was worried, well, what if something happens and I can't ever get it? And then I, my body goes into some sort of panic oh, mode. That's so and so well, think about it. You're right. Yeah. So I thought I need to be able to, I need to be able to not be on them and, and just deal with whatever happens. And so I, um, I have up online how to titrate. And so oh, I took, wait, 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 I, everybody that's listening and watching you too might know the matter. It's like one of those, don't do this at home thing. Right. Because yes. You so really should do it with it with, under the direct. Yeah. So the there's physician. a lot, there's a lot that I did that I didn't realize you really need you. You really like, I just, I just didn't realize. So I had looked up how to titrate and I, took all of my refills that I had left and I slowly decreased it. And it took nine, I took nine months to try to titrate off of this. And so, um, and then I was fine and, but didn't deal with anything. I didn't, um, I didn't do any sort of emotion management. I didn't even know that cognitive behavioral therapy was a thing, which I discovered later, which was super helpful. But um, I just, I didn't realize uh, I didn't, I just, I didn't have the tools to manage things. Some of these self-talk things and some like meditation and even, uh, you know, I, I believe in God and I pray, but even then it was, it was just kind of empty and there wasn't any, I mean, there just wasn't anything to it. And um, then I remember there was a verse. I remember reading a verse talking about be anxious, be anxious about nothing. And don't what does worrying add to your days. And I thought that just struck me at that moment, because I'm I thought that means I have control over my emotions. Somehow I do. I don't know how and I don't know what that looks like. Well, and then uh, later, I discovered cognitive behavioral therapy when I was um, trying to stop drinking alcohol, I was looking for something. Um, AA wasn't for me. I had looked at other um, like faith-based programs. They didn't look like for me. I, my husband and I definitely did not want to check me in anywhere. And so we were like, what do we do? So I was looking for things and I had discovered, actually, I brought the book out in case anybody wants to see this. It's called Smart Recovery. Okay. And all it is, is a tailored cognitive behavioral therapy tailored to alcohol and any kind of addiction. And actually I find it very useful for food addiction. Uh, some of the tactics, but, um, but it's all about um, think looking at when you feel something to stop and not respond and wait and see like, and then examining your feeling like, is it reasonable to feel this way about this thing right now? And that was really foreign to me to think because I, I always just thought I feel what I feel and I think what I think and that's just how it is and I have no control over it. But being able to um, and then others have come along and, you know, they say things like reframing your thoughts and um, things like that. But learning to have control over my emotions. So that was key with anxiety, because when something happens, is it reasonable to be anxious about this right now? Is it reasonable to feel like I'm in danger? Is it reasonable to be fearful? And most of the time it's not. <laughs> and but that took a lot of time. That's a lot of time. And it's it is a phenomenon to me that it is so exhausting when there's no physical effort and it's all emotional. It's a it's that whole psychological phenomenon to me is amazing. Yeah, it is. But meanwhile, you were eating foods that were messing with your brain chemistry. Yes. Yep. So you I mean it's it's kind of like if you were drunk and you were trying to, you know, walk a straight line. Yeah. You can't. Because, yep. you know, I mean, you could try to talk yourself into it, but, you know, so it's amazing that you got, had any progress while you were having all these processed foods in your life that were messing with your brain chemistry. Well, and that's the second part of it is, yeah, there was a little bit there, but nothing like when cleaning up my diet, nothing like when we finding it. So it did get better when I eliminated um, animal products. Things did seem to get better. And because I was also adding, even though I was eating a lot of vegan junk food, I was adding plant foods. I was eating quite a bit of plant foods, but I just allowed myself to have whatever vegan junk food I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But, and then when cleaning it up and so feeling the difference 
uh, the clarity of mind and able to manage emotions. Cause it's not like nothing ever bothers me, but when it comes up, it's, it's manageable and it's not so severe. It's not the end of the world. It's like things are more naturally even and not numbed out like it was on antidepressants with antidepressants. It was like, it was just being numb to, there was no highs, there was no lows. It was just, and no, no real joy, but I could, you know, tolerate the world. So it was okay. But there, the, the difference between getting cleaned out, get in, in your brain in your mind and your being cleaned out in that way and just being content, like, and not numbed out like that state of contentment where uh, you can have joy, but it's not this super shoot up um, high and you can be sorrowful, but it's not this way depressive low. And uh, yeah. And yes, the di- I can absolutely, in my opinion, the diet absolutely affects all of that. Yeah. So let's just clarify, because Anne has has a question for you. Do you change? Did you change depression and anxiety first? She said, "I'm trying to do that first because I can never last long enough with a healthy plan to make a difference." So, this I think you're going to be very helpful here. So I'm just going to sit back and let you talk. <laughs> I will say for all of that, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, change your food first. <laughs> If you try to work on anything else, uh, and this was for me, and I've heard from other people, other people, um, listening to other people's stories and testimonies online and on YouTube and at lectures, doctors would bring people in and I love lectures. And, um, if you try to, if we try to go about, and this seems to be the consensus when struggling emotionally, when you try to go about things, when your brain is such a mess, it's, it's, it's impossible. You're just in a catch 22 all the time. But we can absolutely control. I mean, we have so little control and we are powerless over so much in the world. But what goes in our mouth, we can absolutely control. And it is like, I wish I could say that I didn't think there was any willpower involved, but there kind of is a degree. I mean, you have to just decide that you want to be well and you're tired of all of this. And the food, I mean, it's all you got to do. Just focus on the food. Don't worry about anything else. And just eat well, eat whole plant foods, knock out all the whole processed foods. If it's whole plant food, just eat it and figure it out. Find some recipes. Everybody's got some great books and websites and all that stuff. And I absolutely think um, the changes in food comes first. And definitely, probably I'd add sunshine and exercise. Yes, there is so much research now talking about sunshine. And people think, oh, because of vitamin Mm -hmm. D. Yes, that's important, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, There's something called infrared light, and it goes right through our body. Think about when you were a kid, maybe you did this, maybe you took a flashlight and stuck it up to the palm of your hand and saw the red glow inside of your skin. Well, that's what happens when you are exposed to sunlight, but you don't see it. It is going through several layers of your skin and into your body. And we were, we're, of course, you probably, everybody, Green Warriors, have heard that you, you, you're supposed to be out in the sunshine and you're, and you're not supposed to be indoors a lot. But it, it's so much deeper than that. You just really, and the great thing about it is you can have long sleeves, shirt, and pants on. And that infrared light will go through your clothing. Yeah into your yeah. skin, into your body. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I don't want to get a sunburn. You can be in the shade and the, and that infrared light will reflect off of green leaves in the trees and bounce in onto you in the shade. I mean, have you ever yep. seen like crazy weeds that, that you're trying to get rid of and they just keep growing? Because they, they, they're looking for the light. Well, inside of you, it's looking for the light too and it's going to find it. So mm-hmm. I I agree with you getting out in that in that sunshine even in in the winter time it's just be out there even just for 10 minutes a day or you know I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, I hope that helps you Anne and I hope that you're get, getting motivation from today because this is this could be the day, right? This could be Anne's day to to to, to get started and to make a change. And I hope I hope that she I is. hope so because when struggling with depression and anxiety, it is a beast. It's a beast to um, try to make changes, and 
when, um, you know, for me, it's uh, just that sitting in the house, watching something on TV, eating that junk food and um, totally numbing out, just like with alcohol. It's, uh, you know, and when you're talking about taking that away and you have to go, not only are you depressed and anxious, but now you have to go through the discomfort of wanting to indulge and you can't because you've decided not to. Yeah. It's, um, but it doesn't take long. It really doesn't like once we get started and if you just keep figure out whatever it is to hang on and keep telling yourself, my brain will adapt. My, my body will adapt. This won't be uncomfortable forever. And it's not because I know I can be hyperbolic myself when I'm emotional. This is the worst thing ever. This is pain, you know, and it's like, but it's not really. I mean, it's uncomfortable. It's extremely uncomfortable, but we can endure it. We can endure it. Like, we can't endure a fire, but we can endure being uncomfortable when we want to indulge in something unhealthy and choose not to. And um, it stinks, <laughs> but we can do it. Yeah. And you, you had to to give up the, the, the alcohol and that that's a big deal it just in itself, just to give that up. And because typically, I will say, yeah, I will say that the processed foods was for me harder than the alcohol. But now I, with the, having said that when I went off alcohol, I still had processed foods in my life. So I, I probably had that crutch. And so that's yeah. why it felt harder getting off the processed food. But um, yeah, just, the and then so um just reading about all that they're doing all that they're putting into the foods and and just i mean marketing that making them marketing them to make you addicted and just realizing you have to it's with anything like that you have to you have to not let yourself have it and go through the pain the pain the discomfort yes. and um and pretty soon it'll be not uncomfortable anymore yeah, that's the thing to, 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 and a lot of people have different stressors in their life and, and they're so used to comforting themselves with whether it's alcohol or food. But I mean, they, they say that at the Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, they serve donuts. So it's going from one yeah. you know, addiction to, to something else. And, and uh, yeah, that's so true. And there's so many other conditions that you had at the same time that, that would just make it, I think, more challenging. Um, HealthNet 2020 said, I have diabetes and I'm worried about potatoes, especially white and fruit. Can you eat these? Yeah. So we were just talking about that. So, um, so um, many of the, if you listen to some of these plant-based doctor, these whole plant food doctors, they'll, um, they'll explain to you the different fats that we have. And we have intramyocellular lipids that are that build up in our muscles. And that's, that comes predominantly from animal products and it builds up in there. And I can tell you like just when I ditched and, and I'm sure like oil adds to that or nuts, if you eat too many, I'm sure that kind of stuff, but, um, but predominantly, uh, animal products. And once I got those out, it seemed like things started to clean up. I told you like my number, my glucose numbers started to come down, not anything super impressive, but they were coming down. And a little bit more, a little bit more as I went on. And then as I cleaned up, uh, but I started eating potatoes right away. And um, so I'll, this, the, what I started to tell you about was I wanted to do an experiment after some point when my glucose levels were, so, um, my glucose numbers were kind of leveling out. I was like, I want to test this white potato thing. And so I fixed eight eight potatoes and they, they weren't giant ones. Like you think of big, big giant ones, but they were like, you know, they were like that about like that and about eight of them. And, um, I ate them in one sitting, one meal it was a mono meal. And then every hour on the hour, and I had the low end of the normal range, a normal range, not a diabetic range, a normal range. I tested on the hour. So I had the normal rise in glucose because I just ate something anything it would you have the normal rise and then i had a fall and it came back and it, yeah it was not the problem and same with pasta i had tested it with pasta i don't really eat pasta anymore i don't even know when i had it last yeah um but uh same with um pasta and I wanted to test Ezekiel bread before, but I don't really eat that anymore either. <laughs> I might I might eat it, but I just I just don't right now. 
Yeah, and while you were speaking, I was showing these are pictures that uh, Julian sent to me of, yeah. of things that she eats, and look what's there: yep. potatoes and fruit, right? And yep. you had diabetes, so do, were you on any insulin or anything, or you just no? Nope. I never diabetes? did never meds. I didn't want to take meds for any. Yeah, I just didn't want to do that. All I had heard was you get on one med and then there's usually another medication that has to combat some side effects of this one. And then there's another one. And, and I just never saw anybody get better. It just, it just made the numbers on the little monitors reflect what they wanted it to reflect, but I didn't see any changes in health. So I just, and then on top of that side effects that were, I mean, anywhere from like eye vision, um, heart, uh, heart problems from taking these meds so yeah i just no i just yeah didn't. And, and and that's the thing they they say that if you continue on this track of the diabetes that eventually your pancreas will kind of poop out and will stop mm -hmm. making the insulin and then it'll be difficult to to reverse the diabetes the type 2 diabetes yeah. so if any of you are are you know facing that type two diabetes? I hope that you would consider adopting this lifestyle before it gets to the point where you'd have to be put on insulin because then it might be a lot more challenging. Yeah. So my first exposure to any plant based doctor, and I had to go back in my Amazon order list to oh, go check that down. <laughs> but so, um, in what was it in, on? February, okay, February 1st, 2016, I ordered a glucose monitor because I was worried. This was 2016. Yeah, that's um, for, before they had the continuous glucose monitors yeah. that they have today. Yeah. So I ordered one from Amazon and then, because uh, I was worried, I knew, I knew, like, yeah. you know, but then on February, so that was February 1st, then on February 7th, I ordered <laughs> Joel Furman's end of diabetes. <laughs> Because I knew I had it and I had read it. I, I could probably pull it off the shelf and I put sticky notes in it and yeah. highlighted and all that stuff and mm -hmm. back on the shelf it went. Mm. <laughs> and until later and then I it was like um it's like I forgot that I had got his book because I, I think I was listening to a lecture that somebody had put up on YouTube and I was like, I'm gonna go look him up and I had his book on the shelf. <laughs> wow. See that? He's so sweet. Yeah, I wonder how many people actually have these books on their bookshelves at home that they purchased yeah. and didn't even open, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably a lot of people that uh, that have that. And whenever, yeah, I just, I think about that. I think I've heard a lot of people talk about how sad they were when they found out that their parents who were sick and eventually you know, didn't get well, that they had some yeah. of these books and that they didn't even read them. And if only they, they would have seen them. Yeah. It, it, that's a tough thing. And I, I know that my mother and my grandmother had type two diabetes and, you know, nobody knew at that time. Well, a lot of doctors still don't know what, what it is that's, that causes it and, and how to heal from it. So, but they had it. And, and I, I could even, especially with my mother, I mean, if she didn't have some, she carried around candy bars inside of her purse. And if she didn't have something that she was uh, eating every like one or two hours, she would say, I'm crashing, I'm crashing. And she, and she would just not be good. And, and I, as, as I was, you know, I mean, I wasn't obese, but I was gaining weight year after year. And I was feeling that, that weak kind of shaky feeling in between meals and and I would have to snack in between meals because I actually felt I had brain fog, I had shakiness, I had I was very irritable, and mm -hmm. so and I said, oh, I guess it's going to happen to me. And that and that was not until I found out about the lifestyle that fortunately I didn't get to that point where I had to be on any medication, and I was able to get my my numbers down before the uh, doctor thought that they needed to medicate me, but. Now I can go, you know, if I'm busy and I'm not thinking about things and I'm just occupied, I can go for, you know, six hours and, and, and all of a sudden I'll say, wait a minute, I need to eat. And, and, and yeah. it, it shocks me to this day that I can do that. 
but I still have the, 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 I still get anxious though. If, when I think about, if I have to go somewhere, you know, I want to know that I'm going to either be able to eat what's there, or I'm going to bring something with me. It's just this old thing that haunts me from feeling yeah. so, so shaky in between meals and not wanting. I used to carry gum around with me all the time because, you know, just <laughs> to carry me through or something. So, but I still, I, do you feel that way? Did, did you ever get that way? Like uncomfortable in between meals or irritable or? Strangely, no, not between meals. Um, well, so, you know, for a long time, I just ate what I wanted when I wanted, but since changing my diet, so one, so I had, I realized that I was a natural hygienist way before I knew what natural hygiene was. And so I discovered, um, you know, Herbert Shelton and the NHA and like a uh, gold hammer. And, um, so water fast, water only fasting has been a part of my journey. And I find it's, this is, it sounds so strange to me, but I find it comforting being someone who's a, who's, who I would say is a food addict and a binge eater, but there's something comforting. And I think it might be, have to do with that rules thing. It's like, there's a rule. There's no eating during this period while you're water only fasting. But um, the practice of fasting and then even uh, playing around with intermittent fasting and different things like that, uh, I think has been helpful for that because so traveling, if I can't pack my food, it's like, well, then you're just fasting or then I'm just fasting. And if I'm going to someone's house and there's nothing there or traveling and I can't find anything in the airport or, you know, then, well, it's just a fast day or, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's been helpful with that. That's great. I don't know if I'll ever get that, but, but you didn't have that feeling in between the meals. So, or maybe that was, I was always trying to not to gain more weight. So I think that that was yeah. my problem. I wasn't snacking a lot because snacking is bad. And so I would, and, and if I had known that like, oh, I would have to just have an apple or have some fruit in between meals. Right. And, and, but I thought, I thought that that fruit was bad. And now, you know, we know yeah. that fruit is not a bad thing. So yeah, there's a, all these misinformation, which is just, it's just so sad. It really is. Well, it can be challenging coming into this because there are so many perspectives, like um, just take uh, Dr. McDougall and um, Dr. Berman, for example. I mean, both great and have great stuff to say, but one is pro nuts and one is no nuts. Right. And, but they're, but every, when you look at everybody, Esselstyn, Caldwell, Clapper, Gregor, whatever, when you're looking at these doctors, especially the ones that are clinicians actually um, treating patients, yeah. they're all coming from different perspectives and they're all treating things specifically. And uh, I think they're all right, but you have to, I have enjoyed over this time, just, I'm, I think I'm a scientist at heart. So I've enjoyed, I don't just take it and read it and that's it. I experiment with my own body. So step one was getting that glucose monitor. And I wanted to play around with things. I played around with my diet. I played around um, with, can I have the white potatoes? Can I have some pasta? Can I, or not? Or do I need to exclude those things? Um, so things like that, paying attention, really, really paying attention to my body and looking at things and then experimenting with um, different. So like uh, McDougall has the, you know, the starch solution with um, kind of playing around with your plate, half starch, half vegetables, or you can lessen the starches and increase the vegetables. So playing around with that. And lately I've been playing around, this will happen by accident. So I've been um, experimenting with high raw and that kind of happened by accident because it's summer and it was warm and I just really wasn't wanting cooked foods. I wanted the cold raw foods. And I realized that probably at that time, about 95% of my calories were coming from raw foods. And I felt the best I've ever felt, but I still like my potatoes and I like some grains and beans now and then, uh, and especially in winter. Oh, so there's this, um, what do they call it in the raw world? Like raw till four. Have you heard of this? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I'm like, I don't, I can go raw all the time. So raw till four, I don't know is necessary, but raw till season four, uh, <laughs> might be my thing because when winter comes around, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting me some soup. Right. You want that warm. Yeah. Yeah. It is very comforting. Yeah, yeah exactly. 
I often wonder if people who are struggling should just get a glucose monitor, even if they don't have diabetes or prediabetes, just to, like you said, and yeah, make it's fine. And see how are these foods affecting me? Because then it might make sense. I know that for some people that I know, they can't have oatmeal. It'll yeah. just, yeah, it'll make them make them crave more food, and and they and they gain weight when they have oatmeal in it. So I think that that you're on to that, where it's we're all different, and different foods affect us differently. So yeah, I wonder if that that would be a great experiment. I think if somebody was struggling just to see, you know, how oh yeah, because there's foods might affect them. All these um, clinicians we have out here, they're all great. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. we can all list them. There, there's like a community of them that are mm -hmm. sort of the main ones, you know, the the showstoppers. And they've all got great perspectives. And it's like, take all of them and kind of yeah. try stuff out and see how your body responds. And I mean, the body is so made to heal. Like someone worded it, the body's natural state is that of health. And it wants to get there and it's doing everything it can despite our efforts. But there comes a point where we're tipping it in the wrong direction. Um, but it wants to heal. It can be forgiving while we experiment with these, you know, staying within the health, like, you know, whole plant foods, but, you know, the different perspectives within whole plant food thinking. There's different perspectives within there, but you stay in there. There's room for your body to, I, I think anyway, to kind of experiment and see what's good for you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that said, I suffer with IBS and would like to adopt a whole food plant-based diet. I'm worried about all the fiber. Are you able to eat beans? Yeah, I mean, that's another thing. You had ideas. Yeah. I mean, goodness, how, how did you navigate that? I've never had a problem with beans. And I felt like um, I don't, I, I've never isolated anything specific for beans. So like, um, you know, a lot of times to, to really find out how a food affects you, you have to eliminate a bunch of stuff. But so like going a few days without beans and then having beans, I've never had a, I've never had a problem with beans. So I don't know if that's, you know, I think it, like that everybody's different. Cause like, um, chef AJ is like, she can't do it. Yeah. No beans. And I've heard other people say the same thing and they have their different reactions that they have. But um, the fiber thing, so um, what is his first, Will, Will Bolshevitz? Will Bolshevitz, I had him on he's, the show, um, yeah. Yeah, he's, a, I watched him on a Rich Roll podcast and I have his book. And Fibers he really kind of breaks, yeah. yeah. And he really kind of breaks that down, especially like the FODMAPs and how we may not have to be so worried about that stuff, but maybe we need to build things up slowly and determine if we have a true sensitivity or not. But um, yeah. I just kind of, I was kind of of the mind, just go for it and see what happens. And then if you notice you had a, you know, a big bowl of beans and you're not so comfortable, well, maybe not have so many beans the next time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess with the IBS, if people are just so worried because they feel like they're, a lot of the things that yeah. are, is affecting them. And, and Dr. Clapper, he said on my show, chew your food to a cream. And, you know, yeah. use those 32 uh, teeth in your mouth to chew, 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 and don't swallow it until it's actually in the liquid form. And and because he said that a lot of the times the reason why we get gas or uncomfortable is, is because we're swallowing so much air yes. inside yeah. of the plants. You know, it's kind of like those little plastic uh, popper things that, that you would yeah. get that will wrap up something fragile. Imagine you know, if, if that was something that you would swallow, you would have all those pockets of air. But if you chewed and you were popping all the, and you'd have to work yeah. hard at popping every little single bubble to make it flat. And that's what you have to think about when you're eating your food. I do my best to do that, to chew it up completely. But sometimes my body just pushes it down before yes. I'm ready. I'm trying yes. to soft it. And it's like, no, I want it to go down. Yeah. I think but, that we uh, have taste buds, you know, like in the back of our throat too, you know, yeah. because it's like you can't just chew the food and then and spit it out. The satisfaction is that the yeah, salt, it's, that's where yeah. you feel, that's where you feel the, the good part about it. So it's not just the taste of it. It's that whatever that is that you're swallowing. So, yeah. 
it, it is tough. Yeah, yeah, so I am making an effort. So I know we have those enzymes that start in the mouth, the digestive starts the minute it hits your tongue. And so just slowing down, making sure I'm slowing. And um, I noticed lately, instead of I maybe used to pop like three grapes at a time, but I one grape at a time and chew it one grape at a time and chew it. Yeah. And I don't know, little things, I find myself making an effort, but sometimes the food just doesn't want to get chewed. Yeah. Well, As, like that, like that. Not like and it just goes to show we're just, we're the, just these primitive beings walking around in these sophisticated bodies, yeah. you know, thinking that, you know, we've got computers and clothes and, 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 but we're still primitive beings. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, let me just see if I think that I had, um, Mona wanted to know, I find myself wanting to eat past satiety. Sometimes my abdomen does hurt. Any suggestion? I am whole food plant-based exclusive. Yeah, so that for, for myself, that goes to the uh, neuroplasticity and neuroadapting to not doing that. So we're, when we want to eat past satiety to the point of discomfort, that's kind of an addiction. It's kind of a habit in itself, even if it's a healthy food. So for me, and Joel Furman was instrumental in helping me understand this, getting, um, making, it's got to be abstinence from overeating. So abstinence from pushing yourself too far and you have to make yourself stop. Now, at first it feels like a deprivation because I want it. I want to eat that much, even though it's full and all that. I want the satisfaction of eating and eating. And there's kind of, it's not the same dopamine rush as like whole as uh, processed foods or anything, but there is a little bit there. Obviously we need that to desire food. But once we make ourselves stop doing that, well, pretty soon we'll adapt to this is how much food I get. But so getting in touch, that's a tricky thing. So I do not think I've overcome food addiction by any means. I think it's a it's a all the time managing thing for me right now. And I think it's going to be a little while. But um, the getting in touch with our hunger and satiety mechanisms, like really paying attention to our bodies and trying, um, Joel Furman will say like, stop before you get full. And how do I know? Like for me, that's <laughs> when is that? But um, learning to find that out, to kind of test it out. And, and, but it's the, it's the hard work of making yourself stop and then knowing that the discomfort of making yourself stop won't be so uncomfortable after some time. Yeah, yeah, that is, it is tough. And I think about if you, were, if you were eating and then you started overeating and let's say the doorbell rang or the phone rang or, or something and you were interrupted and you had to talk to somebody, right? you wouldn't be feeling the need to eat that food because you were distracted with this conversation that you're having. So it is possible to stop. It's yeah. just something has to be done with your brain in, in order to do it. And yeah. I, and, and it's so I, that that's something that I think is a very thing, difficult to, to think about. I mean, we, my husband likes to buy grapes, and so I wash all the grapes and I cut them up in the, these little sprigs, so mm -hmm. that you know you can just grab one out of the refrigerator and you'll have like two or three there, you know. And wow, when that happens, I go to the refrigerator, I take it, and I leave, and then and I'm like, that's all. And then all of a sudden, I come back, I'll just get one more. You know? <laughs> and not that grapes aren't healthy, but wow, you could just keep going, and then it would. Yeah because first of all you would be overeating and, and not feeling well afterwards and also yeah now you're eating past that that hunger drive so when i love that our body is designed that way so we don't have to you know it just feels very unnatural to have to calorie count and weigh and measure and things but we know when we why why do we keep eating to make ourselves uncomfortable and this is like i ask myself that all the time why did you do that why did you do that and, uh, you know, but it's there, we can feel it and we can rely on it and trust it. And pretty soon if we do the time and put the work in, um, it'll feel normal and it won't feel like a deprivation to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just listening to the broadcast like this one and finding people like you and hearing stories and just reading the books like you, um, and you can get them on audio book every day. I am either listening to a YouTube broadcast or I'm listening to a podcast from listening to an audio book every day, even though I know all this, 
I need to hear it every single day to be reminded of it. And also, well, I'd like to learn new things too, but just to have it to be a normal part of my life. And I, and I think it'll always be that way for me. And I think that knowledge is power and you can't unlearn it. Right. Yeah. 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 Once you see it, it does make it pretty hard. So learning, uh, you know, learn reading salt, sugar, fat, and learning about bliss points and what the food companies are doing and it makes you angry. And, yeah, I've slipped up and, you know, at first I was really angry. It kept me a long time out of, out of fast food and processed food, but then, you know, something happens and you're like, well, this time and all that, but it makes it harder to keep doing it because you're like, I, you know, I just think I can't be a part of that. I just can't anymore. Not for my own body and not to support that kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Get angry for, for all these uh, companies that are making these spooks to control you and, and yeah. get so angry that you won't be controlled anymore. I think, well, Jillian, I mean, your courage in sharing your challenges and your triumphs and all the incredible benefits of adopting a whole food plant-based lifestyle. I know it's just going to be so helpful to everybody that's watching and listening and there anybody that, tunes in my green warriors that anybody that's striving for better health and happiness it was a lot for you to talk about and 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 you're still you're still going through this right it's not over it's a, it's an ongoing thing that you're just trying to be yeah. conscious of and 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 i want people to be able to relate to that and thank you so much julian it's just oh, thank you it's just so wonderful and everybody click like and show your appreciation that's how we clap that's how we give applause for what Jillian shared with us today. Jillian, so tell us, what do you do and how can we find you on social media? Well, I've been a, a stay-at-home mom forever. And like I said, the kids have grown and I've kind of been flitting around. My husband works back east. And so we visit, we go there and then we come back to those arcs and uh, visiting family. And I've spent the last couple of years working on a couple of certifications for nutrition. And I hope to get a couple more. I didn't want to do the registered dietitian route. Um, I liked the the certifications that focus on whole plant foods better. So I've been doing that. And hopefully soon I'll get nice and solid and steady to be able to be doing something, be doing something to help somebody along. And I have family members that ask questions and kind of want help here and there. So getting a little bit experienced that way, but maybe someday, uh, helping people along that way, what it'll look like. I don't know. I threw a YouTube channel up a long time ago and I might do something with it sometime. I'm not sure what I'll do with it. But, uh, and then like we talked about our community here in, uh, North central Arkansas, there's definitely a health conscious community up here that, but I don't see anything, um, quite like, quite as serious and diligent as the whole food, whole plant food, like SOS free. And uh, so, you know, maybe that, but right now I'm just kind of getting solid and. Yep. That's what they say. Put your oxygen mask on first and then help others. And you're just yeah. about ready to, to help <laughs> other things. And, and you launched it today, I think. And I, I want everybody to click like for this comment to help support and give a shout out to Diane, Diana Varner. Three Yay. weeks, no alcohol. I'm getting chills. Three weeks, no alcohol, no animal products. Lost six pounds in September. Everybody click like. Show Great. your love for Diana. Oh, that was so nice of you to share. And Diana, Congratulations, Diana. Isn't that great? And you're And you're inspiring other people that are watching and listening too. So this is, oh, I love to hear these things. Thank you for sharing that, Diana. That is just so great. That is exciting. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Because alcohol is a thing. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. So what what, do you, what would your take home message be to our Green Warriors, Celia? Um, don't be afraid to do the work. Go ahead and jump in and uh, I think I like that question where someone asked, should I try to work on my mental stuff first before trying to make healthy changes and definitely change the food. It makes everything else. And it doesn't take that long. I think 
what do they say? It takes three weeks or 21 days to kind of get a, a habit established. Just give yourself some time and be patient and loving with yourself and commit to it. And then uh, it just seems like all these other things just start to happen a little bit easier and a little bit more easy to manage. And uh, don't be afraid to do the work. It's going to like for a lot, some people, they talk about how easy it was and some it's a little harder and don't shy away from that. And Put in the time, put in the work, be patient with yourself, and just keep trucking. Yes. All right. And, and come back and watch this again if you need the inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, Green Warriors, I would like to know what is your take-home message? What are you going to remember from today's uh, broadcast? Type that in the comments below. I also wanted to thank Just Task Voice because she did the countdown and she did the promos. And just test voice, tell us who's coming up next. Is managing diabetes the best we can do? Learn what's not in any Harvard medical textbook and what most doctors don't know about diabetes reversal. Join us as we learn from Peter Rogers, MD, Wednesday, October 11th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on Be Green with Amy Live. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot from him. I know I am. And Green Warriors, I want to thank all of you most of all for joining us today because we're yes, here to, to give you the support and the information that you need and the encouragement. And I love how you come back again and again and share things with us. And we really are, are so appreciative of that. And to show my appreciation, if you go to my website, begreenwithamy.com slash join, I'll send you five free recipes. So if you want to get started on this lifestyle or if you just want to, to add some recipes onto your game, they'll be there for you. And I would like to uh, also tell everybody today, I think especially a lot of people that joined in today could use this. Take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and take your left hand and grab your right shoulder. Now squeeze. Because that's a hug from me to you and from me to you, Jillian. <laughs> and Thank if you guys, yeah, it, it was just such a joy to have you. And Green Warriors, if you would like to join me and Jillian with my tagline, you can type it in the comments below. Are you ready, Jillian? Mm -hmm. Okay. Until I see all of you again, remember, be strong, be well, and be Green. green. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jillian. Bye, Green Thank you. Warriors. Bye, everyone. Bye. Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be 